What's up, Speak For Yourself listeners? It's your boy, Shay Sharp, co-host of FS1's Undisputed. I wanted to tell you about my new podcast, Club Shay Shay, where we always do something before two something. Each week, I sit down with a guest for a drink and conversation, and as host and proprietor of Club Shay Shay, I welcome in esteemed guests such as Snoop Dogg, Floyd Money Mayweather, LeVar Ball, Isaiah Thomas, just to mention a few. Whether I'm talking to an athlete, a musician, an actor, or a lifelong friend, Club Shay Shay is a place where people share inspiring and motivational stories about their journeys to prominence. The new episode drops every Monday on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to Club Shay Shay now and make sure you never miss a new episode. Now, back to Speak for Yourself. Welcome to Speak for Yourself. Marcellus Wiley, R&B singer or gospel? Gospel. Yeah, gospel. too big to be R&B. Old Luther, though. And Emmanuel Immaculate Acho over there. Another victory in Swag Wars today. My dog. Weird combination, but it works. Uh, green and purple, whatever. Let's get to our top story. Brought to you by Popeye's Chicken Sandwich. I got to get one of those. A phenomenal phenomenal combination. Really? Yeah, yeah I hear Chicken you. Sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> On Monday, the league announced the 2021 Hall of Fame game. Woo. It will feature the Steelers and the Cowboys. Speaking of phenomenal combinations, the same matchup scheduled for the 2020 Hall of Fame game before it was canceled due to the pandemic. Pittsburgh and Dallas are two of the winningest franchises in NFL history, but both teams have big quarterbacking decisions to make moving forward. So, Acho, who has bigger question marks this offseason? The Steelers or the Cowboys? How about them Cowboys? How about them? Um, the Dallas Cowboys got the bigger question marks, big dog, because they have question marks everywhere as I see it. Let's start with this. Cowboys have a question mark as their head coach. Is he a competent and quality head coach? You mean the Super Bowl winning head coach? Yeah, the Super Bowl oh, winning head oh, coach okay, who actually okay. has a losing record outside of his Hall of Fame quarterback. That one... The Super Bowl winning head coach who has a losing record outside of Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers. That one, because on the flip side, Whoa. Mike, Mike no Tomlin also has a Hall of Fame quarterback. He does. Ben Roethlisberger. Oh, he looking but up. outside of Ben Roethlisberger, Mike Tomlin is still a winning head coach. So mm. first question I got is, mm. at the coaching level, Cowboys, yeah. what's really good? I just told y'all, but see it with your own eyes. Mike Tomlin without Big Ben, 18 oh, and 15. God. Every quarterback that has started multiple games for Mike Tomlin actually has a winning record. But Mike McCarthy without Favre and Rodgers, uh, Marcellus, that's a palindrome, one, two, two, one. <laughs> but that don't look good now, nah, team. Palindrome, same thing forward and backwards. I know what she's talking about. Home. Um, so that's, that's my first question yeah. around the coach. My second question as around the star players. Oh, boys, the players commanding the highest cap. Jalen Smith, mm. Tyron Smith, mm. Zach Martin, Ezekiel Elliott, Dak Prescott. All those players, Amari Cooper. Only Amari Cooper, Marcellus, played every game and played a good season last year. I'm getting you. Only Amari Cooper played every game and played a good season. I'm going to give you all these names again because they're stars so you all remember them. Demarcus Lawrence, $25 million hit. Amari Cooper, $20-plus million hit. Zach Martin, Tyron Smith, Ezekiel Elliott, Dak Prescott, Lyle Collins. Only Amari Cooper played all the games and played Amari. well. Mind you, Amari, Amari Cooper still missed one game. So I have questions around the star players because T.J. Watt, star player for the Steelers, he was in the running for Defensive Player of the Year. Mm. Minka Fitzpatrick, star player for the Steelers, mm. he was balling as, as safety again. And now I also have questions about the quarterback position. See, because the difference between the Cowboys and the Steelers, first day of offseason this year, mm. Cowboys don't have a quarterback. Mm. That Prescott technically would have to be tagged again. Mm. Well, whereas the Steelers, Ben Roethlisberger is still under contract. So those are just a few of my questions. Cowboys have so, so, so many more than these Steelers, big dog. Uh, I would love to come up here and give you some fireworks and disagree with you. But I'm just going to disagree with you without the fireworks, okay? <laughs> you know it's the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, every single day when I'm taking my little biscuit to preschool, why in the hell is he going to preschool? He's going to pre-pre-K. I don't know what they call it, DK, all this stuff. Whatever, it costs too much. That's all I know. <laughs> but anyway, every day we're driving, we're on a one-on-one -on -one freeway, and we look to the left, we look to the east, and guess what we see? Universal Studios. Mm. And every day my son says, Daddy, when are we going to be able to go to Universal Studios again? I'm like, son, one day soon after the pandemic. I talk to my son like a real young man so he can understand this real world. Let me speak to you, young man, Please. so you can understand this real world. Please do. Um, when we're talking about an experience, uh, two things come to mind when I think about any experience, an attraction, amusement park, whatever it may be, any journey. Mm -hmm. One is, what is the path? 
and the path of least resistance. And the second thing will be, who is my tour guide? Because I'm unfamiliar with this conversation, this situation. When I look at the Pittsburgh Steelers, oh, that is not the path of least resistance versus the Cowboys. What won the division in the NFC East last year? What was that record? Seven and nine. Yeah, buddy. What was the record that won it in the AFC North? Oh, was it seven and nine? No, it wasn't. Matter of fact, let's go further than that because you know the answer. You're hurting right now. Um, the AFC North had the most difficult road to difficult division mm -hmm. by wins and losses, correct? 60% win percentage, 38, 25, and 1. Uh, okay, so we talked about mm, the path of least resistance. Oh, Pittsburgh has the path of most resistance. Okay. Now let's talk about the tour guide. Because you know what? Who cares about all those obstacles in the way? As long as we have the most important position solidified. Ben Roethlisberger, lead us. Oh, God, Lord. Ben Roethlisberger. The same guy who's still contemplating retirement again, again, again. The same guy who won't help and mentor anyone. The same guy who sent signals upstairs to the organization that I'm on the fence. So guess what the organization has to do. What's that? Prepare for the next in the now. Mmm. Let's talk about the now before we get to the next. Mm -hmm. Ben Roethlisberger started off 11-0 this year. They were out there balling. What had happened was the last five games. One and four. Oh, that's a trend right there. Let's look at his completion percentage. Went down. Yards per attempt went down. Touchdown interception ratio got ugly. Passer rating dropped down to 83. Woo! So my tour guide is not so good because Dak Prescott, last time healthy, had the number one offense. And even in the four games before the injury, Dak Prescott was on a record-breaking pace. We got a bad tour guide, and we got the path of most resistance. But you're going to get up here and tell me it's the Dallas Cowboys. I'm not going to get into the cap. I will if you need me to. I'm not going to get into the star players. I will if you need me to. But all I know is no matter who I'm with, the journey that's in front of me is more difficult if I'm a Pittsburgh Steeler. I like that take. Hey, buddy. Like that take. Hey, dog. <laughs> you came for a vulnerability, Marcellus, and I'm so proud of you for that. You came for vulnerability. But with that tour guide take, I have an experience of my own, Sal. Nigeria? Because, uh, no, 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 no. Okay. I'm, I'm not going to go Nigeria. I'm not going to touch your heartstrings just yet. <laughs> I saved that for about the 45-minute mark into the show. Let's after do. a little bit more week. <laughs> um, so I was Wait. at an amusement park about a year and a half ago before COVID. And I'm at this amusement park, and I had set up a private tour, right? I was like, you know what? You know, I, I, I set up a private joint. Spent a little bit of bread. I did. Yeah. But when I set up my private tour and I get to this amusement park, okay. the tour guy, he confused. Mm. First day on a job. Mm. So he don't know how to take me from this part of the park to this part of the park. So you know what I had to do? Uh. Can I speak to a manager? Ooh, because every now and then, the tour guide can get trumped by a manager. I hear you. So can we talk about the manager? Oh, don't you do this. Can I speak to the manager, Mike Tomlin? I knew it. Because Mike Tomlin has had 14 consecutive <sighs> non-losing seasons. Jeez. Can I speak to the manager, mm. Mike McCarthy? Mm. Mike McCarthy has had three consecutive losing seasons as a head coach. Mm. So I applaud the uh. tour guides and their efforts, Marcellus. I genuinely do. I applaud <laughs> Dak Prescott. I applaud all his efforts. But uh. sooner or later, you come up and you say, can I speak to the manager? Because mm. it really don't matter what the tour guide has in store okay. if the manager can trump the tour guide. And as I look at it, Dak Prescott can be a great leader, tour guide, if you will, for the Dallas Cowboys. Mm. But the tour guide's ability is always trumped when that manager steps on the scene. And as I look at it, give me the manager who okay. had his organization 12 and 4 last year, uh. as opposed to the manager had, who had his organization at 6 and 10. Mm. Give me the manager who the year before, when his quarterback was not around, Ben was, Roethlisberger was hurt, only played two games two years ago. Right. He still went 8-8, eight and eight, as opposed to the team who was fully functioning with Dak Prescott playing every game, and they went 8-8. Eight and eight. Marcellus, with Devlin mm. Duck Hodges and Mason Rudolph. <laughs> not Duck. Duck. <laughs> Quackity quack. <laughs> with Devlin Duck Hodges and Mason Rudolph, Mike Tomlin still went 8-8. Eight and eight. Mm. With Dak Prescott, Zeke, and all them cats firing on all cylinders, they went 8-8. Eight and eight. It's really a pale in comparison. The Cowboys have questions in perpetuity. Mm. Questions that cannot be answered. Mm. That is the issue at hand, whereas the Steelers, yeah, they got one little question. One little question. Mm. But it got an answer. One little question? One little question. Oh, let's little torture question. our amusement park example some more. Because you spent that money. You spent that dough on that private yeah. tour guide. Yeah. I know exactly. That's a great experience. Once you go there, you don't want to go back, back to Gym Pop. Go back. You can't go to Gym Pop. Like, you just can't get in the three-hour line. That said, you had some money to spend, so yes, you sir. spent it. Yes, sir. You don't have money to spend. 
What if your cap situation is 27th worst in the NFL? Maybe you don't have enough money to spend. Maybe you're stuck in gin pop and you don't know any better. That's the Pittsburgh Steelers situation. That's why that's a bad situation. Let's talk about the fact that the Pittsburgh Steelers also in their crew ain't really got it. Nobody chipping in on this, big dog. Y'all had the worst rushing offense last year when you talk about the Pittsburgh Steelers. The worst. And we talk about, you talk about Zeke. Zeke was bad last year for his standards. And it still wasn't as bad as what the Pittsburgh Steelers were seeing day in, day out at the running back position. But you told me that all things will be okay because the manager came and settled Mm -hmm. all the issues. Really? Did the manager settle the issue that this team that won 11 games before it lost one, 12 in total, was one and done in the playoffs. What a future Hall of Fame quarterback. Who is coming back after he jumped off the middle of the fence talking about, you know what, you got me. I want to play one more year. He said that two, three times in his career. So I'm looking at this situation simply as you don't have the resources that you need to really add to this team. You got some potential departures. Juju Smith-Schuster, whatever you think of him. <laughs> okay, Bud Dupree, notable free agents, guys. James Conner, Marquise Pouncey. Like, you got guys that are either gone or may be gone on a team that doesn't have a ton of money with a quarterback who's iffy. Tell me if you were really going to have fun at that amusement park. Yeah, that's fair, and I'm not mad at that. But I would honestly rather some sort of decisiveness as opposed to all the indecisiveness, if that's even a word, going on in Dallas. You got Pouncey. He already said Pouncey and Pouncey, they retired. So you know they gone. gone. Um, Bud Dupree, he tore his ACL, but he was tagged last year. He might be gone. My issue with the Cowboys sell is do I stay or do I move on from Tyron Smith? Tyron Smith hasn't played a full season in five years. All pro, all everything left tackle. Mm. You could not build a left tackle more ideal than Tyron Smith. 6'7", 315, long yeah. range. You know Tyron Smith, yeah, uh, yeah. USC cat. Yeah, then you have Zach Martin. Yes. He only played 10 games last year. He saw his dog, Travis Frederick, retire the year before. Mm. Then you got Lyell Collins. Missed all of last season. Oh, They're right tackle with the, hip, with the hip injury. We're doing this. I'm just wondering, so you got all these injuries for the Cowboys. I can't make a decision if you're indecisive. Uh. Like Jerry Jones, he's almost hamstrung by his, his, his offensive line. Tyron Smith, you playing or you not? <laughs> and if you do play, are you staying healthy? Are you like, good? Jerry yeah. Jones is hamstrung mm. by all the players that are in limbo. You can't even move on because you got so many guys in limbo. That's my issue with the Cowboys is you, you still holding on to Sean Lee. And linebacker, like Sean Lee is still on the roster. You know he like a coach, player, coach, or something like that. He's, <laughs> he's, ain't nobody really counting on him to get out there but and stay it's, healthy. It's like he's taking up a roster spot. You're right. You feel me? And it's only 53 of them. Mm. Roster spots are limited in the NFL. Mm. Cowboys have three to five guys mm. just holding on to roster spots because they've been grandfathered in based on their previous accomplishments with the organization. Mm. That's not healthy for this team. Well... You know what's not healthy for this team also? Regression. No matter if you're on the roster, you got a name or not. Or are you living up to that name with your game? Ben Roethlisberger last year, his passing yards per game was his worst since 2012. Mm, okay. Yards per attempt was his worst ever. Uh-oh, what does that mean? That is a key indicator when a guy is going to be 39 this year is throwing the ball right before his face. Like, da, da. I mean, we were talking about Drew Brees and air yards, but nobody... Drew Brees stole the thunder from air yards that it should have landed on Ben Roethlisberger. (sighs) Passer rating the worst since 2017. You're not seeing a a better Ben Roethlisberger. You're not seeing a better tour guide. You're not seeing a better situation. And you want to talk about the guys up front? We just mentioned Pouncey, retired, right? What about Alejandro Villanueva? Uh, Is he coming back? You know that? I don't know. Matt Filer, is he coming back? I don't know. That's three guys up front already potentially are all gone. Hmm. And you're talking about the offensive line of the Dallas Cowboys. I'm looking at this Steelers team, and let's talk about the mentality, the mindset, the dual scoreboard. They won 12 games, so I'm not going to slight them there. They're ahead of the Cowboys in the win-loss column. But if you win 12 games and 11 straight before you lose one, and then this year you get off to a fast start, you doubt your own fast start. That's fair. You know, you you get into a situation where you're like, is Ben going to be ready at the end? Is Ben going to lead us to the promised land. Like, look at the AFC. Cleveland, who can't win a playoff game ever, went to Pittsburgh and won a playoff. And that was a playoff game. And that's a 12-4 and team saying that. What if they go back to the pack? How are they going to But if you're the Cowboys, I would doubt my competency in totality. 
Like, if I'm the Steelers, I might doubt my late season competency. They ain't started 11 and no. Then we ended up finishing one and five in our last six games. I might doubt my late season competency. Mm. But if you're the Cowboys, remember mm. what they said at the beginning of the season. Ezekiel Elliott's quote's not mine. This is the most talented roster I've been a part of. Yeah. Remember, Zeke was on a roster. He came into a roster with Dez Bryant, with Jason Witten, with Cole Beasley, all pro Cole Beasley for those that scoff at the name, with himself, with Dak Great. Prescott, Tony Romo starting over Dak Prescott. And Zeke said... This roster was the most talented roster, and you still end up going 6-10, and 10, whatever the case may be. Yes, that got hurt. If I'm the Steelers, I may doubt my end-of-season competency, but if I'm the Cowboys, I doubt my competency in totality. And so I haven't even brought up the defense. Don't bring like, it I up. Didn't, I didn't even do that they to you. They play better like, in the I, second half of the season. I didn't even do that to you, big dog. Oh, really? I'm, well, you should have brought you got, it. You got a top three defense versus a bottom 15 defense. Hey, it's not even apples to apples. Where I'm from, if you pull your gun out, you better shoot it. And I don't want to hear about I could have. I had more bullets. You should have let them go. Go. Because if I'm on the Pittsburgh Steelers, two years ago we were eight and eight. Mm -hmm. I was like, damn, all we need is Ben Roethlisberger. It's home. And then you get Ben Roethlisberger and you go 12 and four. And then you're like, yeah, but we need more than Ben Roethlisberger. The problem is Ben is coming back and he's not coming back at his best. Coming up at the top of the hour, we know how long Anthony Davis will be out with a calf strain, but we don't know if LeBron's Lakers can hold on in the Western Conference without AD. But first, Draymond Green made some waves with his comments about the double standard between NBA stars and teams. We'll open it up to all sports and tell you what we think next on Speak For Yourself. Can't miss. Can't miss. Hey, Speak For Yourself listeners. I wanted to tell you about our brand new Fox Sports app and website, foxsports.com. Reimagine for the modern sports fan. Go ahead, download the new app now. You don't even have to pause this episode. Every day on the new app and website, you'll see the top stories in sports, plus a rich world of written content, videos, social media, and analytics to give you a 360-degree view of the most important stories of the day. Streaming live TV has never been so easy or elegant. Every Fox Sports game, including all pregame and postgame shows, are just one click away. For the extra invested fan, we also go deep with real-time wagering lines, trending prop bets, win probability, and key player projections. So download the new Fox Sports app or visit www.foxsports.com. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself. Draymond Green tied his career high with 16 assists in the Warriors' win over the Cavs Monday night. A nice game for the three-time NBA champ, but Draymond made his biggest statement of the night at the post-game press conference, where he shared his thoughts on the double standard between NBA teams and their superstars. Y'all take a listen. I would like to talk about something that's really bothering me. It's the treatment of players in this league. To, to watch Andre Drummond before the game... Uh, sit on the sideline, then go to the back, and then come out in street clothes because a team is going to trade him is <laughs> Because when James Harden asked for a trade, he was castrated for wanting to go to a different team, and everybody destroyed that man. And yet a team can come out and say, oh, we want to trade a guy, and then that guy is to go sit. And if he doesn't stay professional, then he's a cancer and he's not good in someone's locker room and he's the issue. At some point, as players, we need to be treated with the same respect and have the same rights that the team can have. Talk that talk, Draymond. Now, so this isn't just an NBA issue. I feel like this is a pro sports issue. So let's go macro, go bigger picture. Is there a double standard between teams and their star players? No, there's not a double standard. And it's not just the NBA issue. You're right. It's not just a sports issue. You're right. It's a life issue. And uh, let's talk a little life up here. Um, unless the game has done a drastic 180 turn since I played and since you played, I don't think it needs to be umbrellaed and termed as mistreating its athletes. Uh, since we all know it hasn't gotten worse, it's gotten better. We know some current athletes and how they're compensated, how they're properly treated, I must disagree with the sentiment coming out from Draymond Green. What's happening is Draymond is confusing. What a lot of people are confusing, double standard with different worlds. I'm going to say it again. Double standard with different worlds. Double standard implies that you're in the same world with two different realities. And I understand why people get confused there. They think that. But the truth is, we're actually in just two different realities. Ask Michael Jordan. 
who's an owner. We are employees, brother. I know we are glorified employees. 80,000 people showed up to watch me just work and not 80,000 people show up for everybody's job employment. But what happens from that perspective is you start to get a God complex. You start to lose your way. You start to realize that, hey, maybe I'm not just the same as other employees. Draymond Green and others need some real world friends to understand perspective. Because when you are an employee, there are two names on your check, yours and whoever's paying you. You guys don't live in the same reality. It's just that simple. So if you don't like bosses, be a boss. <laughs> simple as that. Oh, you can't be a boss. Well, then being a boss comes with its perks, comes with its privileges. <laughs> I, I made up a Wileyism one day, just sitting there in the lab, just thinking. I was like, you know what? You only despise authority when you think you can never be authority. People look up and only get mad at up when they never think they're going to be up. <laughs> and I'm looking at this situation with athletes. And I, I'm just going to start off with just some objective analysis. Gave you my, my thoughts on it. Here's some objective analysis just to show you what respect looks like. Because respect can be perception-based. Most of the time, it actually is. You're, you're, you're processing what you think you feel and what you think they're doing, so therefore, it's based on how I feel. But I also look at a job as showing respect in other ways, other facets, like compensation. In the NFL, in the last decade, since 2011, the average annual salary has went from 18 million to 45 million. Highest average sal salary in the NFL, 18 to 45. NBA has went from 27 to 42. Baseball is 27 to 36. It's outpacing inflation by a mile, lapping inflation. So when you talk to me about respect, I'm like, okay, what are your measurements? What are your metrics? Because this metric right here is undeniable. They are showing you respect. You're just not showing the same gratitude. I like that take. The, the, the issue I have to. is this. Fire. There is a double standard in reaction from the fans. Oh. And I really think oh. that's where Draymond feels it most. Okay. There, there's a double standard in reaction. There's a double standard in standard. What do I mean? Mm. Harrison Barnes, Marcellus, you remember when Harrison Barnes was playing for the Dallas Mavericks, yeah. middle of the game, he gets traded. They yeah. pull him during the middle of a game. Y'all remember this. And, 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 the, and the broadcast is, has a screenshot of Harrison Barnes to see there, reports that he just got traded uh, for Boogie, for Justin Jacksons and Zach Randolph. Now, hmm. conversely, remember when Andrew Luck's retirement got announced middle of a preseason game. Andrew Luck gets booed yeah, walking did. off the field. Andrew Luck, like the great Andrew Luck and all he did for the Colts, <laughs> resurging them after Peyton Manning. Yeah. He gets booed walking off the field. He didn't ask for a trade. Mm. He didn't ask to leave. He said, you know what? Mm. I can't do this anymore physically. And he gets booed, but Harrison Barnes, who gets pulled in the middle of the game, gets turned into a meme. Hmm. That, Marcellus, I think, is where the double standard lies. Mm. The double standard lies when a player signs a contract, and the NFL will go, a player signs a contract, that contract is binding for the player. Yeah. It's not binding for the team. You're right. And so how is there not a double standard when there quite literally are contracts that aren't in fact contracts because a contract is not dually binding? The mm. contract is only by players so say, want my freedom. Yo, let me go. I've outpaced myself for this contract, mm. but I can't get my freedom. But the team yeah. looks at the player and, nah, you've underperformed on the contract, so we can cut you. That in and of itself screams unfair, and it screams mm. and urges double standard. Ah, I can't, I can't attack that. I can't negate what you just said there. It, it's almost built into the infrastructure of employee versus employer that there are going to be benefits that you just can't go past. You just can't surpass. In sports, wouldn't you it, say specifically? Because I don't think in life, like, oh. on our I ain't seen no contract, oh. but I don't think, like, you can't just up in one day Fox be like, you know what, Marcellus? Nah, you didn't have a good uh, show today. Uh, You're done with uh, no repercussions. Okay, well, let me say this. Um, if you know the real world people, 
Non-competes happen every single day. They sit down employees every single day, usually at the executive level. They just say, pay leave of absence. They say, non-compete. You can go somewhere else, but you got 90 days to wait and do that. Oh, you're taken care of, but guess what? You're not going anywhere else. Uh, that's a little infringement on your rights and liberty at that time, but we don't make a big stink of it because 80,000 people don't go to someone's job and watch that transaction. Transfers, leaves of absences. Um, but one of my best friends, Matt Lindzen, has lived in five different states, in like eight different cities as an executive. Every Midnight hour, hey man, you know what? The plant is closing, hey man, we need you over here. And that just happens like nothing in the real world. But we're athletes, we got a God complex. We think we're bigger than we are. You know why? My wife broke this down to me. I'm gonna tell you why we, we think we're bigger than we are. And I fought her tooth and nail. But you know, if once you get into a relationship for real, stop being super single, you're gonna come to this realization. You will internally nod at stuff that you externally are disagreeing with. I was trying to win the argument, but she was breaking it down. Athletes typically go from zero or little to everything. Yes, sir. In our 20s, we skip a step. We skip the middle step that most of the real world has to go through that allows them to understand value, allows them to understand properly appreciation because they have to work their way up the mountain. Whereas we're at the bottom of the mountain, next thing you know, a helicopter comes and puts us at the apex and say, you arrived. We didn't have to do the same kind of grind in the same manner. What's lost in that is all of a sudden, hey man, have you ever noticed this? In our locker room, I'm 25 years old. I'm a star athlete. Anybody in the NFL is treated better than most workers in their oh, normal absolutely. jobs. But let you be the man. You, you grab a towel, wipe your brow, you know, hit your pits, throw it on the ground, and some guy that's older than you, who's employed by that franchise, will run, grab that towel, and throw it in the laundry basket with pride. And with that pride, all he wants is two things. One. Hey, I like being around all you guys. This is an opportunity. But two, the opportunity to get that foot in the door so I could climb within this organization. We don't even look at life like that. We don't even have that perspective because we took the helicopter past that point in life. Let me tell you what happens in our world. Imagine this, Acho, because <laughs> this is a quote from Draymond Green. He wants athletes to be treated with the same respect and the same rights a team has. Treated with the same respect and the same rights a team has? Oh, you and I are not treated the same, and we on the same damn show. I'm not gonna say who's getting treated better. I think you get treated better than me, but <laughs> they love you. Every day at this show, producers Acho, and they don't say nothing to me. But the point of this is, imagine this, Acho, that the FCC that governs networks would sit there and say, oh, we need to treat Acho the same as we treat Fox the corporation. You know damn well that ain't happening. So what is Draymond talking about? You know what Draymond is doing right now? He's pandering. It is no, smart. No. Oh, he's pandering. Come oh, on, Seth. That's a volatile word. You yeah. can't just throw pandering out there. Like volatile word. <laughs> volatile, volatile word. Fred Hampton. Uh, let me tell you. Look, I know he's going to have support because he's speaking to power. Anytime you speak to power, people are like, yes. But that's not the proper medicine. He's putting peroxide on something that needs surgery. And he's trying to act like, yo, it's fixed. You still need to look at it deeper than that. I'm going to tell you simple, and I'm going to let you get some of this. Some of these ribs. What, what Draymond doesn't understand, and everyone needs to understand is, Sometimes you can lose that perspective and then you live in this alt universe and you think that that is reality. Why do you think so many of us athletes struggle in transition? Because we're going to a different world once we retire. And that's just, rest in peace, Vincent Jackson and everybody else who's been through some of these rigors. That is underlining a lot of the issues with us. We are now out of orbit. We're out of space. And then when we have to hit reality, we don't know what that really feels like. You speak in truth. You speak in bars. I'm not going to disagree with anything you said. Okay. I'm just going to pivot to the other part of what Draymond said. What did he say? Because what else Draymond said is, you, you, he said castrated James Harden in regards to... Follow the word! Exactly. Follow the word! I'm, I'm a pivot. <laughs> he criticized James Harden for requesting a trade. Mm. We criticized James Harden for mailing it in. But Marcellus, think about this. NBA players get pulled out of a game so they don't get hurt, so that they can be trivializing their abilities. They just want to trade their, those abilities. Mm. James Harden did the same thing. He mailed it in. Yeah, Remember, he James Harden, he mailed it in the final three games because he was trying to protect himself. The same 
thing teams mm. do. Mm. They pull a player to mm. protect that asset because they want to ship that asset off. Yeah. The player, he pulls his own abilities to protect his own assets because he wants to be moved. Yet right. we treat and respond to it differently. That is oh. where I think James or, um, Draymond Green hit the nail on the head. Mm. We don't respond to those two things the same. We look at ownership when a player gets traded and just say, oh, okay, he's getting traded. But then when a player is like, you know what? I want to get traded. How dare you? You're under contract. Fulfill that contract. You were obligated to that contract. You're getting paid millions of dollars to play this game. Mm, Let's mm. keep in mind, players and what they make pale in comparison to ownership. Yeah. Like Phil said, comes with different responsibilities, comes with different levels of privilege. But nonetheless, we respond to it differently. Draymond did not miss, and nor do I think he pandered, at least not with that aspect, because that's 100% facts. Woo. Power has its privileges, and people don't want to respect power, so they're not going to respect the difference in the privileges. It's just that simple, man. Um, owning anything in this world, you have more power than the person that works for you. Whether you have a nanny or not, I mean, it, whether you have an a, a entertainment company or not, Acho, what, what, your production of uncomfortable conversations, you get to make the ultimate decisions. And... I don't like a world where Twitter reaction <laughs> becomes your premise of how the world is accepted. Can we talk things. respect then? Because oh, let's be, talk respect. You can have more privilege than another person, but their respect should be equal across the board. And that's the word Draymond used. Mm. Because Draymond let's said, go. I want as a player to be treated with the same respect, respect. Okay. as ownership. Not necessarily the same privileges, okay. but I want to be treated with the same respect. I'll give it to you like this, though, because we want to talk privileges. I walked into uh, Lincoln Financial Field where the Eagles play. It might have been my last season there, my third or fourth year in the league. Mm -hmm. I walk into the stadium, and I'm like, yo, Jeffrey Lurie, the owner, he owns all of this. I was like, yo, that's mind-blowing. Big. Like, it's, it's mind-blowing. Yeah. I'm looking at that, and I'm like, yo, he owns all of this. But then I said, wait a second. <laughs> He has to pay for all this. <laughs> right? and like, Come with a responsibility. I flipped it on his head. And I was like, yo, yo, he has the privilege of owning all these checks. That's the privilege. Mm. However, when we're talking respect, everybody, I think, should get that same amount of respect, which the players are not getting. Man, ah, respect. What a, what a choice word right there, because we all measure respect differently. Someone steps on my shoes when I'm in Vegas at the club. Whatever. Got more shoes, and it ain't that serious. Someone else in my group gets their shoes stepped on. It's about to ignite into fireworks. And I, I don't have a, an objective answer to what respect means, but I will tell you what I've learned to experience what respect is defined as. It's something that you perceive in your head how someone else perceives you. Do they respect you? Now, that question is answered in so many different ways for so many different people. You think something is disrespectful, and then I won't think the same thing is disrespectful. So we have to get to some objective measure of respect. And if you're in a business relationship, the primary way to show respect is compensation. What's the love language of sports? How much you paying for me, bro? Like, the, you could treat me like trash, and if I'm the highest paid player, you're not really treating me like trash. However, if I'm the lowest paid player, but you say every day, attaboy, oh, I love you, Marcellus. Yeah. That's real. That's real. I don't know if you really respect me. So sometimes you just got to get out your own way. I don't know if Draymond understands this, but you don't know what you don't know. And losing perspective with the real world and losing perspective of how they're really treating you. Draymond, <laughs> they call him Mr. Triple Single. But he ain't making triple single in money. He making triple double dollars, right? And I'm just letting these guys know, man, I know I come out as uh, with a minority viewpoint, with something that people don't really want to understand. But I just got to say this last point. I read a book. You remember, remember the book, uh, Respect the Writer, uh, $40 million Slaves. You ever read that book or heard about that book? Man, that book took me. A lot of places. And I love that. I don't need you to affirm what I'm believing. I need you to inform me on some things I don't know. But one of the things that was a little dangerous in my response to that book was the fact that I started to look at sports as a plantation. And a lot of other people want to go there. And I know underlining this conversation, a lot of people want to talk about it like that too. But they just ain't ready. And I remember reading that book and finding the finer points and saying, this is an amazing book. But also, $40 million slaves? And the equation to sports, 
Now, did I ever see a slave dream of becoming a slave? Because I know I dreamt of being a professional athlete. Did you dream of becoming a professional athlete? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, was it ever deemed in society with esteem that slavery was a preferred way of life? But athletes and athletics is a preferred way of life. Uh, did it ever pro slavery provide a life-changing opportunity for generational wealth like it did for me, for you, and thousands of others? Nah, bruh. I just look at the situation where that book took me to a place where this conversation takes me to as well. It's this mindset that is almost plantation-based. Oh, they telling us what to do, and they're not taking care of us. And I'm wondering, Nacho, how much of it is linked to that mindset or how much of it is really in the direct moment of the present? Are you really being disrespected, Draymond Green, when you have that platform and that forum to make this much of a conversation and reach off of just the way you feel? Is that really disrespectful? Let's park here. And, and we're Let's going park somewhere, here. America. I don't know if y'all ready, so buckle up your seatbelts. Um, is, it, is it incredibly hyperbolic to compare pro sports to slavery? Absolutely. Okay. It's one of the most hyperbolic comparisons you can ever. You should have told me that before I read the book. Like, <laughs> is it incredibly hyperbolic? Absolutely. Okay. okay. But are there some parallels? Okay. Yes. Okay. And I think that is where, even when you when you dive into this conversation with Draymond Green, are there parallels between three NFL owners are worth more than eight billion dollars? Three, eight billion dollars. Average NFL owner has. Billions to his name. Say. The NFL salary, roughly on like you're talking about the averages, the the the, the introductory players, they're making eight hundred thousand dollars to eight billion dollars. So again, you see the average person. If you're not in pro sports, you're like these guys are making millions. Mm. These guys are making hundreds of thousands. I don't want to hear about it. But remember, you're talking about what is someone working for, and then what er, what is the person who they are working for netting? Because think about this mm. for y'all at home who don't know. Mm. You go to a playoff game, Marcellus Wiley, mm. and the first playoff game checks everybody make the same amount of money. I don't know if y'all know this at home. So if the highest played player, his annual game check is a million dollars, come to playoffs, everybody only makes about 32000 for that first check. Facts. But those ticket prices aren't the same. Say it, facts. So the owner is hitting a lick come to playoffs, but the players are taking severe pay cuts. Even if you win a Super Bowl, you only mm. get maybe $100, $120,000. I say only because there are some players whose game checks are a million dollars. So again, come to Super Bowl. You're getting a pay cut, several players are, but the owner is getting a pay raise. Hyperbolic to make that comparison between slavery and, and pro sports. Incredibly hyperbolic and to a degree it's asinine. But you would be ignorant if you overlooked the parallels. Mm. And the parallels being players are working and doing this for X amount of minimal dollars and top tier ownership is making exponential what the players are working for. I think those are the parallels that people ignore. Yes, however, if that is reality, then all of us are guilty of that same reality when we are in the position of ownership. Day one of uncomfortable conversations. Yes, and you have your staff, whatever it looks like. I'm sure it has grown since day one, correct? Absolutely. And who I was the staff. Who? <laughs> I'm the staff now. <laughs> <laughs> but beep game, dog. When you grow the staff and then they get their salaries, great. But who reaps the most benefits, or at least should? The creator. Emmanuel Acho. Like, you can keep giving bumps and bumps, but your bumps is going to be greater than the bumps you're given. So, to me, it's a false equivalence for this same reason. Whether it's race or what I believe in, which is the class. Haves and have-nots, bruh. And... It's so funny it gets distorted because we throw race into a class conversation. We throw class yeah, into a race real. conversation. That's real. That's real. In this situation, dog, it could be white. It could be black. It could be brown. But whatever you want to say, what's common denominator of it all is green. Draymond Green. <laughs> Coming up, <laughs> Hall of Famer and friend of the show, Terrell Owens is skipping this year's ceremony in Canton. We'll tell you if we agree with T.O.'s reasoning next on Speak for Yourself. When I think about Black History Month, I think about people who are doing it now, leading the way. 
I think about the modern athlete, because I am an athlete. I think about LeBron James, Colin Kaepernick, Maya Moore, Kenny Stills, Anquan Bolden. I think about the Malcolm Jenkins of the world that's walking the halls of Congress to make things better for all people. I think that the modern athlete is redefining what it means to be athlete. The modern athlete is saying, look, we don't have to sit in a box anymore and just play ball. We don't have to shut up and dribble. The modern athlete is leading the second wave of the civil rights movement. I love Black History Month because it gives us the opportunity to highlight people who are doing it now and also pay homage to the people who paved the way before us. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself. Let's go to Canton. Something that Hall of Famer Terrell Owens won't be doing. Terrell Owens is planning to skip this year's ceremony and explain his reasoning to Newsday, saying, why I wouldn't go. No disrespect to anybody that got in, but I just don't understand the process. Calvin Johnson got in on the first ballot. This has nothing to do with Calvin himself. The guy was a beast, but there's no justification when you have receivers, Torrey Holt and Reggie Wayne, that have done equal or greater things. So I should, oof. You have an issue with Terrell Owens' criticism of the Hall of Fame process? I do, big dog, but I do for a couple reasons. Mm. Number one, um, Terrell Owens, you're going to end up hitting somebody with a stray bullet, a verbal <laughs> stray bullet, right? Like, you that. end up disrespecting Calvin mm. Johnson, even though you said no disrespect yeah. for those at home. Mm. Something disrespectful is always followed by no disrespect. Mm -hmm. So you're going to end up hitting Bingo. somebody with a verbal stray bullet in the process. But, so my biggest issue is really... There will always be problems when debating opinions. Yes. And right now, the Hall of Fame process, it's opinion-based. And as long as it's subjective, there will always be an issue with it. So what I propose, Marcellus, uh -oh. is something objective. What I propose yes. is an objective yes. metric to yes. qualify and figure out yes. who should be in the Hall of Fame, at least in what order you should get there. Yes. So I have my Acho Hall of Fame formula, specifically for receivers. Now, Sal, mm. a thousand yard season would net you two points. A yeah. hundred plus yard, a hundred plus receptions in a season, three points, ten touchdowns, fifteen touchdowns, twenty touchdowns, two points, three points, six points alike. If you lead the league in a statistical category, reception, touchdowns, yards, etc., Four points. First team all pro, five points. You're a pro bowler, that's going to get you two points. You win a Super Bowl, that'll get you five more points. <laughs> now, I understand I am not acknowledging mediocrity. I'm not acknowledging if you don't do anything great, but it's the Hall of Fame, it's not the Hall of Good. Based on this Hall of Fame formula, let's look at where some players would wind up. Again, mm. Jerry Rice, the greatest of all time, as we should be able to tell, would wind up with 213 points. Then you see Randy Moss, 103, T.O., 88. But now it gets to what T.O. was talking about. Mm. Calvin Johnson at 69 points. And then you see Reggie Wayne at 60. See, I've created a metric of objectivity. We no longer have to care about your off-the-field antics. We don't have to care about you doing sit-ups during an interview. <laughs> we don't have to care about if you got in trouble or not. I've created an objective metric which would serve the Hall of Fame. That's my formula. That's the only way that we cannot get into these mindless debates mm. every year about who should be first team, second team, third team, third ballots, that is, et cetera. Goodness. Um, huh. Do I answer the question? Or do I'm, I'm I go interested in your feedback. Yeah, let me do that first. Forget it. It's our show. Let's talk. Um, I like the intention. I, liked, I like the measurements that you placed for every category. Yes, the value of the measurements has Correct. to be changed Correct. because based off of your measurements right here, you try to tell me that Randy Moss is, is only half of Jerry Rice? Only half? Is that? Uh, and, okay. And you try to tell me that um, Jerry Rice is two and a half times better than Terrell Owens? I ain't me, 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 me. I Careers. played against all three of them dudes. Hell no, dog. Hell no. But, but isn't that, you said I. The the, don't you the, think that's the problem with this Hall of Fame criteria? You said I uh, played against uh, them. So I, your I, opinion I, 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 is now in there. Yeah, it is, and it's going to be. Um, because <laughs> Julian Edelman about to catch Terrell Owens because all them damn Super Bowls. You got to be careful. I, look, I like the values. Uh -huh. I don't like the number of the values based on category. But, hey, it's only a two-hour show. We can come back to that. <laughs> but great intention there. Now let me answer this question. I'm torn on this one. Okay. All right. I have no issue with Terrell's grander point. His grander point is the NFL Hall of Fame is broken. And damn it, it is. And for all of my years, 
maybe minus the last five or so, I thought it was perfectly fine. I thought it was something to be cherished. I thought it was the most exclusive club, especially comparing it to other major sports. And now, because we let personality get into it, you just talk to me about, hey, that's how you feel. Well, that's now how the Hall of Fame voters feel about a player. T.O. retired top three in all categories. That's first ballot, bruh. I don't care how many sit-ups he did or didn't do. That's first ballot. And you're trying to tell me it's not first ballot? Now, it's a beautiful story, sad state of affairs, that happened in terms of Therese Paler and the story of him convincing people that T.O. was a Hall of Famer. Read about that story. Amazing. Basically, a writer, brother, stood up and said T.O. was a Hall of Famer because when you look at him, you see a Hall of Famer in not only how he performed, but his contributions, especially to T.O., as I did, even as one of his peers. That said, I got to disagree with T.O. on his suggestion of the minor point, that straight bullet. Hey, don't be, don't be shooting at Calvin Johnson like that. Uh, listen to this line. Calvin Johnson played in 38 fewer games than Torrey Hope and 76 fewer games than Reggie Wayne, but still had more touchdowns, huh? <laughs> and yards per reception than both of them. Ouch. So they all can be in the Hall of Fame, and I, I know the order is a problem, but when you look at <laughs> Calvin Johnson, no shots intended for T. Oh, or Calvin. We got to bring in Fox NFL analyst Bucky Brooks. So, Bucky, you have an issue with T.O. and his criticism of the Hall of Fame process? I mean, I, ha I have a bit of an issue with it just because I, th I think what T.O. and others have to understand, like, this should be a very, very hard process for you to get into. Yeah. It's like getting to the VIP of the club. Everybody can't get in. That's we can't right. let everybody in Thank past you. the velvet ropes. And so you want it to be very, very difficult. And when we think about Hall of Famers. Hall of Famers should be the type of guys that when we played on the field, either with them, against them, we saw them, they impacted the game beyond measure, meaning we couldn't tell the history of the game without mentioning these players. And even though I like Acho's attempt to really kind of create an objective measurement yeah. where you're using metrics, I think it's beyond that. Like, I've been lucky enough to play or be coached by 12 Hall of Fame mm. players or coaches. And so when I think about the common denominator and some of those guys, Marcellus knows some of those guys, mm -hmm. Jim Kelly and Thurman Thomas, Andre Reed, Bruce Smith. When you were on the field with those guys, you sensed those guys, those guys played at a level that we could only dream of. Their dominance you could feel and their dominance transcended different eras. And so I think this process where you have 42 members of a panel who are voting on that, there are a couple of former players on that panel, James Lawton, Dan Faust. You have Tony Dungy, Bill Polian, who've been around the game. What they do is they present the cases of nominees and they talk about it. They shoot it around or whatever. And I know it's not perfect in terms of first ballot, second ballot, how long you get in. But when has the Hall of Fame really gotten it wrong? Are there people in the Hall of Fame that we say are not worthy of being gold jacket guys? And so mm. I know we spend a lot of time talking about when you should go in, and there's a level of prestige to being a first ballot Hall of Famer. But at the end of the day, man, when you walk through the hallowed halls and you're in, you're dancing just like everybody else. And so I know T.O. is upset about not being in there like Randy Moss was in at the first ballot. But man, he's in. He's a Hall of Famer. He's hey, a Golden Jackie guy. Bucky. I think sometimes Bucky. you have to let it go like that. But mm. Bucky, uh, let, first let me push back. And I, this was more of a discussion than a debate. I think this is just a healthy discussion than that. Um, when you talked about how you could qualify the Hall of Fame, you mentioned 12 or 13 players just now that you played with or played against or coached you. Your personal experience. When Marcellus mentioned how he qualifies his greats, Terrell Owens, he mentioned he played against him. The problem is that's so subjective to your opinion, Bucky Brooks, your experience, and Marcellus's experience. But what about the person who didn't have a good experience with Terrell Owens? Because that's why he ended up being third ballot. Because these writers that aren't all players, that weren't all coaches, didn't necessarily have a good experience with T.O. Could have been on the field, could have been off the field. But so if we let our own personal experience, positive or negative vendettas, if you will, if we let that seep into our opinions, we got the same issue with the Hulk.
Like when you look at Philip Rivers, is he a Hall of Famer? Eli Manning, is he a Hall of Famer? If there's no way to quantify it, if there's no metric, we're constantly going to be in debates and in discussions. Because I fervently disagree with anybody who says Philip Rivers is a Hall of Famer. But I can tell you all the people that played with Philip Rivers, they're like, yeah, man, he's a Hall of Famer, one of the best dudes I've ever been around. I mean, now we bring in everybody's Ooh. opinions and how often hey. Philip Rivers invited him over hey. to dinner, bro. Hey. Like, that's hey. the dilemma at hand. Hey, it is a dilemma at hand, and I'm glad we're having a discussion about it. Um, let me push back, though, on these writers who, once again, they have their God complex and their their moment of retribution and getting back at T.O. Look, I don't give a damn how you felt while you were covering my greatness if I'm T.O. Like, I don't care. If I never spoke to a single writer out there, but I finished third or second all time in my receiving categories, you're just going to have to suck it up and say I'm a first ballot. And why does first ballot matter? I need to see Bucky's face matter. for this. It, it matter. matters. It matter. Dog, Bucky, you said the VIP, the club, right? Let me tell you when I go to Vegas, I know I'm about to spend a few stacks. And it's okay, because the experience <laughs> is going to be worth it. I'm hoping. But if you making me wait in line, dog, what I pay for, and then you make me, when I get to the table, I got to wait for my bottles, oh, dog. You know what I'm going to say? Um... What am I paying for Thank right you. now? <laughs> like, the experience mm. matters. You can't make me wait. And when I earned, earned or paid for this opportunity, as T.O. did with his performances. But you know what's wrong with the Broken Hall of Fame right now? That it's too late to fix it. Like, it's not just a recent history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to know why? Go there, you, let's go to the beginnings. And, ooh, I'm going to sound like a hater. But truth hurts. Uh, Joe Namath is in the Hall of Fame. And I'm not taking a shot at Joe Namath. I'm going to take a shot at these numbers. A losing record, 62 and 63. <clears throat> okay, four. Uh, 173 touchdown passes and 220 interceptions. Bruh led the league in throwing interceptions four different years. Basically, Carson Wentz is a Hall of Famer right now. Oh, it got quiet, brother. Let's talk about Lance Swan. Greatness. Won four Super Bowls. We know all that. But he was 12th most in receptions and receiving yards of any player while he played. While he played of his peers, he was 12th. You know who was 12th this year? Brandon Cooks. Is that a Hall of Famer? <laughs> Here's the point. We can't fix all these issues. We can't fix when they get in. We can't fix who's in there. But damn football, y'all had a lead on basketball. Basketball got, man, I ain't going to tell you about the basketball dudes in there. Total contributions to the sport. They got some bums in their Hall of Fame. And baseball eats his own. They won't even let their best players in for various reasons. The point is, and does hockey even have one? Like, they just go to Wayne Gretzky's house every weekend. I don't know what up. The point of it is, football was in in the cherished space. And now look at football's Hall of Fame. It's all a mess. But, Phil, I think that's when we have to realize Super Bowls have to matter, but we need a way for them to matter for everyone. I mean, look at Michael Irvin. Michael Irvin, if not for them three Super Bowls, he not getting in the hall. Let's keep it real. If not for the three Super Bowls in the Niners, nah, I disagree with numbers, that, dog. Compare his numbers. I, I had to do it this morning when making my little metric. I don't compare hear it, Irvin's numbers <laughs> no, to no, everybody dude. else's Man. numbers. Outside of them three chips, he not getting in. It sounds apparent that based on what you did with Lin Swan, outside of them four chips, he's not getting in. There has to be a way for us to say, yeah, you know yes, what? Yes, Super yes. Bowls, Super Bowl MVPs, contributions to Super Bowls, that jumps you to the front of the line as opposed to other people. I looked at it today. Rob Gronkowski, Jimmy Graham, nearly identical stats. They came into the league the same year. Jimmy Graham has played one more year than Gronk because Gronk retired. Nearly identical stats. Gronk, 8,400 yards. Jimmy Graham, 8,300 yards. Gronk, I think, 83 touchdowns. Jimmy Graham, 82 touchdowns. What's the difference? Gronk got four Super Bowl rings. We say, oh, Gronk, he's a first ballot, no doubt. We look at Jimmy Graham like, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. He might not get in. Damn. What's the difference? It's them chips. I'm telling y'all at home. And Gronk didn't even play in one of them Super Bowls. It's still coming. Look, look, look up Gronk and look up Jimmy no, Graham, and I'll you will be mind blown. Hey. Like, wait a sec. So we have to See, figure out how to really calculate all this. I don't want to know that. See, that's the problem with box score scouting right there. Mm. Because when you put Jimmy, Jimmy Graham and Rob Gronkowski on the same field, there's a difference. There's an impact. Like, at some point, you have to feel their Was presence. Was it always that yeah, way, Bucky? I'm saying, New Orleans, Jimmy Graham. Jimmy Graham gave you 16 tugs yes, yes, in a year. Graham is like a four-year span. Are you really scared of Chicago Bear, Jimmy Graham? Are you fearful hey, of... You scared Green of Wizards, Bates, Jordan? Jimmy Graham? No, we're talking, about, we're talking about Rob Gronkowski. And so, when we have these debates in different eras, 
the game continues to change. And so if we're just doing it off numbers, man, we're going to be putting all kinds of guys in. Are we going to say that Wes Welker to, is a guy man. that should be over the all to. the other guys? Like, come on. Like, it, like, at not, some point, it has to be a little subjectivity. Uh, in that's, facts. Uh, that's facts. That's but, facts. But here's the thing, though, Bucky. It's like, if we don't go based off numbers, and what you're saying is, yo, Gronk is just totally different than Jimmy Graham ever was. But remember, Jimmy Graham had 16 touchdowns in a season. Bucky Brooks. He led the league with them things. Jimmy Graham had 16, he had 11, he had 10, he had 10. Like, he was cut from a very similar fabric. Problem was, he went to Seattle, went to Green Bay, down year, Chicago, four year. But like, statistically, removing your opinion, removing my opinion, removing Gronkowski, drinking beer on a boat, removing his Gronk spikes, removing all that, all the, all the fun stuff. Frat statistically, dude. in Frat the regular dude. season, them cats was the same <sighs> dude. Oh, okay, we're going to have a fun game. It's going to be rapid fire. I want you to say, Yimmer, even if they're in it. Bruce Smith. Yes. Okay, these yes. are my teammates. Yes, okay. Thurman Thomas. Yes. 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 Andre Reid. Yes. yes. Yeah. These are all my teammates. Bruce Smith. I already said him. I'm sorry. <laughs> Junior Seau. Yeah. LT. Yeah. Ladanian. Okay. Larry, oh, yes. Larry Allen. Duh. Yes. Okay, Drew Brees. Yes. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> yes, say yes. <laughs> say yes. <laughs> We're going to put him in, but not right away. We got to wait. Hey, it's busy. It's packed in here. A lot of people are stepping. It's hot in here. Fire marshal. Fire marshal. Hey, go get him. Go get him. Hey, got the fire marshal. Hey, Phil, that's how they do you at the club. Hey, man, we got TABC out tonight, man. <laughs> Nobody getting in. Nobody getting in. I got two more. Now, these guys are not in, but tell me if they should be. Rodney Harrison. Reuben Brown. Coming up, Ruben. Anthony Davis. <laughs> Hell yeah, they should get in. Anthony Davis is likely out through the All-Star break with a calf strain. We'll tell you if we're worried about the Lakers without AD. Next, speak for yourself. Y'all are hard. You're watching Speak for Yourself, Marcellus Wiley, Emmanuel Acho, the harsh critic over there. It's time for our big story brought to you by Farmers Insurance. Call 1-800-FARMERS for a quote. The Lakers will be without superstar Anthony Davis for at least two to three weeks after suffering a calf strain in Sunday's loss to the Nuggets. The Lake Show has slipped two games back of the Jazz for the top spot in the court until after the All-Star break in March. Fox Sports NBA analyst Slick Rick DeBuker joins us for this one. But Acho, going to you first. You worried about the Lakers? I ain't worried about no Lakers, people. Yeah, worry about and y'all shouldn't be either. It's very simple. We've seen this before. We've seen LeBron lose his Robin. Uh, we've seen him do it just about each and every year he loses that number two. Can I take y'all back if y'all shall? Because clearly y'all's memories are fading. Uh, 2014 season, D. Wade, he missed 28 games that year. That's 34% of the season. What happened? Braun still went to the finals. 2015-16, Kyrie, he missed 29 games that year. 35% of the season. What happened? Braun Braun still went to the finals. Next year, K. Love, he missed 22 games. 26% of the season. What happened? Bron Bron still went to the finals. What happened in 2017, 2018? Oh, yeah, Kyrie wasn't even there. LeBron had a, a, a group of misfits. You had J.R. Smith. You had Rodney Hood. You had D. Wade for a hot second. You had Tristan Thompson. You had Kevin Love, but he missed about 23 games. What happened? Bron Bron still went to the finals. Why y'all acting like y'all haven't seen the movie Ate the Popcorn with the Butter and the Salt? <laughs> it was a great movie. And at the end of the day, the main character, LeBron James, is still going to be where? In the finals. No, I'm not worried about LeBron losing AD for a period of time because he's lost his Robin before and he ends up in the exact same place. The finals. Mm. I'm worried. I am worried. Um, and I love that you gave me historical perspective historical about LeBron James, except you forgot one part. What I forget? LeBron changed history himself. Uh, him and the Boston Celtics with the big three and then LeBron James with the super teams and then all of a sudden the dynamic duels that have taken over the league now. It doesn't look the same as it did then. So that's the problem. The collection of all-stars that now gather themselves together because LeBron James gathered himself together with other all-stars. Let's talk about the present because it's great to look at the history of the game, except if the present is telling you something different. Lakers against 500 teams or better, just eight and six. Against teams under 500, 13 and one this year. Uh, so they're bottom feeding right now. Who doesn't? I'm not mad at that. Uh, but the Lakers, four and one. 
without Anthony Davis this season. Everybody starts to say, hip, hip, hooray, except those are some sorry teams, y'all. 37 and 69 teams, Thunder, Pistons, Timberwolves, and Bulls. People will start to say, oh, they're going to be fine without Anthony Davis. Oh, uh, really? When you're 14th in the NBA in scoring, uh, when you're 17th in three-point percentage, when you're 24th in turnovers, how is that going to get better without Anthony Davis? Now the Lakers are... Three and five versus teams currently in the Western Conference playoffs. Three and five with Anthony Davis. Now they're without Anthony Davis. You showed me all of those stats, and you gave me five or six line items, different seasons. Mm -hmm. When LeBron James only had four rings, I know that a lot of those ending in losses <laughs> didn't end up him hoisting the trophy at the end of the season. So yeah, the Lakers need to be worried. A lot of those stars return back to the lineup. When you talk about tendinosis, I don't know when Anthony Davis is coming back. And the scariest part is Anthony Davis doesn't even know as well. I was wondering when Dr. Wiley was going to show up. I was waiting for that. <laughs> you know, I am dude. not worried oh, about so, the so, Lakers. I'm actually going to bridge the gap between you two. I am not worried about the Lakers yet. The reason I say that I'm not worried about the Lakers is because they have the second best record in the entire league. How can I be worried about them when it's, yes, behind the Utah Jazz, only two games behind the Utah Jazz. And let's face it, they came into this season cruising because they played longer than anybody other than the Miami Heat and certainly longer than anybody in the Western Conference. I'm also not worried about them because, Marcellus, you are once again cherry-picking when it comes to the numbers. Oh. Go ahead and look at the offensive numbers that are down as if they have anything to do with Anthony Davis how about we look at the fact that defensively, they are the most efficient defense in the league by far and a better defensive team now than they were a year ago when they won the championship. Oh. Talk to him, Slick. Uh, the reason, yeah. Talk to him, the, Slick. You better be better. The reason that I say yet is because they've also had, to your point, Marcellus, they've had one of the easiest schedules to this point. And... Anthony Davis is going to miss two to three weeks and the schedule is definitely going to get stiffer. And so how is that going to wear on LeBron James and the rest of that team? That is a fair question to ask. But when we had all our issues with electricity in the uh, in California a year or so ago, I immediately ran out and bought a generator. Oh I was God. thinking, I do not want to be, uh, <laughs> I don't want to be uh, uh, vulnerable to this happening again. I want to make sure that I'm covered. Mm -hmm. You know how many times I've used that generator? Not a single show. It's still in the box. <laughs> I have yet to use it. So there's reason to have caution, but a lot of times we never break that glass. Thank you. The only injury that matters on a LeBron James team is if the injury is to LeBron James. That's it. The only injury that has ever mattered on a LeBron James team, Marcellus Wiley, I'm talking to you, is your neck getting tighter it is. the circulation. Hey, man. Is, is, <laughs> the injury is to Braun. Mm. You've been to nine finals in the last 10 years. Who got hurt the one year he didn't go? It wasn't AD, it wasn't a K Love, it wasn't a D Wade, it wasn't a Kyrie. It was LeBron. The only year Braun didn't go is when Braun got hurt. So everybody and their mama can get hurt. Everybody and auntie and them can get hurt. But if LeBron don't get hurt, he's still going to end up in the finals again. 2018, Braun went with J.R. Smith, Kevin Love. He had George Hill, oh. Isaiah Thomas, Jay Crowder, Rodney Hood, yeah. Jeff Green. The leading scorers in the playoffs outside of Braun were Kevin Love, J.R. Smith, and Kyle Korver. LeBron had more points in the playoffs than them three combined. So I don't care about anybody mm. else. Mm. I care about LeBron mm -hmm. James and his health. Now, Dr. Wiley, just diagnose that. No, I want to hear Slick Rick the Generator. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what I'm seeing with this team with AD being out is that we're seeing Kyle Kuzma grow into a different role. He has been playing his most inspired basketball. He's been filling in the gap, as we saw in the last game and in various points when AD has, has suffered We've seen Kuz step up. So there's a number of guys that they're actually getting the opportunity because AD is out. When AD is in, they're going to hand him the ball and they're going to play through him a lot. Well, you don't need that right now. So why not develop these new pieces that have come in from last year and get them comfortable so that now when AD does come back, hmm. they're going to be even more, they're going to fit even uh, better with, with what the Lakers do. I, 
I just see this as an opportunity for a lot of things to develop. And certainly nothing the Lakers have done to this point suggests to me that they cannot keep this rolling without AD for a limited period of time. Man, stop. <laughs> when AD comes back, AD doesn't know when he's coming back. They wrestled oh, him. Oh, wait a minute. Dr. Wiley, come <laughs> on now. I thought you called, what was my name yesterday? Dr. Sellers or something? I like <laughs> yeah. that. Uh, and look, look, all I know is they wrestled him for two games, came back, wow. And then now they're saying two to three weeks. They are pulling straws, y'all. They are guessing in the wind. He got hit in the quad in the quad and re-aggravated this injury down low. You know why? Because his chain is off. You can't fix oh, this. this qu- look, I'm not even going to project bad on him. I'm hoping he comes back tomorrow. But the point is, I'm telling you, I've been in this position before, and you guys have heard me talk about injuries, because I was injury prone. They don't know which way is up just yet. Oh, and you want to talk about Kyle Kuzma. How many points you get on the scoreboard for being inspired? Like, inspired doesn't help me. I don't give a damn about your inspiration. Listen to this nugget right here. <laughs> Aside from LeBron and AD, Lakers don't have a single player averaging over 14 points a game. Now, I know the opportunity is going to change, but uh, uh-huh. so far, we have not seen that yet. So, what happens? Uh huh. Here we go. Him, Anthony him, Davis. Slit. You got him nervous, Slit. No, he doesn't. Three years at Los Angeles Laker, LeBron James has been, because I still keep talking about when he was 26 and 25. I'm talking about 36. Three years with Anthony Davis, uh, LeBron being a Laker, and Anthony Davis for two of those years. 75 win percentage with Anthony Davis, 54 without him. But y'all like, ah, uh, you give me numbers. I'm gonna give you did a. Did they not just change half the roster? Did yeah. they not just not make? They did. did they just not improve they the did. roster? Are you yeah. really gonna take the last two years okay. and then suggest okay. that this is not he a tried. significantly different oh, team? Oh, oh, oh. I will he succeed. Tried. Lakers last year, when they, before they had AD, LeBron took it all on his shoulders, got injured, they didn't make the playoffs. Then you get AD. Guess what happens? No injuries, and you win a championship. Y'all trying to say it's not going to be That's something to worry about? Correlation. Boy, That's a false correlation. Coming up, Dodgers. I got a generator for you, Marcellus. <laughs> I'll take it, too. Lots of teams would love to have Deshaun Watson on their roster. The Panthers are reportedly willing to offer Christian McCaffrey and three first-rounders. We'll tell you if that's too much. Next, don't speak for yourself. Come on, man. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself. Let's head over to Houston, where this weekend the Texans owner, Cal McNair, said despite the trade demand, Deshaun Watson will remain a Texan. However, that could change. Reportedly, the Carolina Panthers are all in. I mean all in on Deshaun Watson and would be willing to give up not one, not two, but three first-round picks Mm. and their star running back, Christian McCaffrey. Mm. He got the three-time Pro Bowl quarterback. Needed Bucky Brooks back with us to talk this one out. But Marcellus, you up first. It's three first-round picks. Plus, all pro Christian McCaffrey, too steep for Deshaun Watson. <laughs> Hell yeah, too steep for Deshaun. Too steep for anybody in my mind. Uh, the situation, because i got to be objective here. Uh, he hasn't proven to me in terms of doing more than his circumstances. Let's think about it. His circumstances with the Houston Texans and the 29-27 and 27 overall record and the two playoff appearances and the one playoff win is exactly the same record and the same number of playoff appearances they had in the four years prior to Deshaun Watson. So if you're not going to be greater than your circumstances, no matter how great you are individually, I can't give up three first-rounders, three different potential position players that can have impact and a bona fide star in our league in Christian McCaffrey. I understand the injury concerns and the injury issues last year, but I'm not giving up something proven and three potential impact players for Deshaun Watson, who right now hasn't showed me just yet that he is that type of impact player for the <laughs> team's success. I remind everyone that Deshaun Watson got snatched. Up 24 to Donut in the playoffs by Patrick Mahomes, who ends up getting lapped by a 43-year-old <laughs> next year in the Super Bowl. So how can I bet all of that, the entire farm, on Deshaun Watson when I don't have the resume to support it? Yeah, three first-round picks and Christian McCaffrey for Deshaun Watson is ludicrous. I mean, That's you crazy. can't put Deshaun Watson on a, ro- on a roster with a relatively empty cupboard and expect him to ball out. Let me clear a misconception up early on before we continue to run with this. Let's go. 
The Buccaneers did not just insert Tom Brady and all of a sudden the Buccaneers went from seven and nine to Super Bowl champions. They added Rob Gronkowski, Hall of Famer, Antonio Brown, Hall of Famer, Leonard Fournette, first round pick at running back. And then they won the Super Bowl because in the Super Bowl, who scored the Buccaneers touchdowns? Hall of Famer, Rob Gronkowski, Hall of Famer, Antonio Brown. First round pick, Leonard Fournette. So it wasn't just plug Tom Brady, insert Tom Brady to an exactly identical roster and win. It was insert incredibly talented quarterback with a loaded cupboard and then win. Don't go and get Deshaun Watson if you ain't got nothing out there with him to play with. Mm. I understand Robbie Anderson. I understand DJ Moore. I get all that. But you're going to need more than that to make legitimate noise in that conference. <laughs> Oh, man, you guys, you guys, you guys are over there hanging on to them picks. Man, it's about <laughs> players over picks. Why are we worried about what could be See, when we already have a proven player? We have Deshaun Watson. And, oh, Marcellus, I heard you over there besmirching his name, talking about he hasn't done anything. Last year, he's playing for a boo-boo team. And all he does is put up the best numbers of his career, best completion percentage, best touchdown numbers, best passer rating. And if he's not playing on such a garbage team that was 4-12, and we will be talking about him in the MVP conversation based on the numbers that he put up. And now you're over there hanging tight to Christian McCaffrey. Matt Rule, I understand what Matt Rule is saying. How can I miss what I never had? Christian McCaffrey wasn't even on the field last year for him. So to give up three possibles for Deshaun Watson, a proven top five quarterback, you have to do that. But I know what I'm doing. I'm sitting at the table with two guys who must have never played spades before. Uh -huh. Because Here we go. Deshaun Watson uh -huh. is the do big this. joker. I'm horrible. Don't He's do the this. big joker. You're over, there, you're over there throwing out clubs and hearts and diamonds. Look. You have an opportunity to get a franchise quarterback, a quarterback that can net you back a Super Bowl. Because we've seen, unless you have a top guy, it is hard to compete in the winner's circle for a Super Bowl. You can talk about Nick Foles. You can throw out Joe Flacco. You can throw out Trent Dilfer. But if you don't have a guy, you're Brad not Johnson? hoisting the trophy. <laughs> Matt Rule and David Tepper understand that. That's why they're willing to give it all. For Deshaun Watson. No, 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 no. Here's the problem, Bucky. I used to play spades like it was my job. If I got paid for playing spades, I would be Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates rich. Oh, you liar! Used to play. Everybody out there like they can play spades, Here's the boy. problem, Bucky. <laughs> Here's the problem, Bucky. Yes, Deshaun Watson may be the big joker. For those at home that don't ever play spades, one, learn how to play. Two, <laughs> big joker's a trump card. But all the big joker is worth, Bucky Brooks, is one book. That's it. Now, it's going to win every book, but it's worth one book. Now, Deshaun Watson, you got to get to the Super Bowl for us to play that Deshaun Watson big joker card, and that mean nothing. Ooh. But I'm not going to trade my ace of clubs, Oof. my ace of spades, Oof. my ace of diamonds, oh. my ace of hearts he for play. one big joker. Because it's just what, Bucky Brooks? It's one Book coming up. <laughs> the Nets had no problem putting up 136 points without a member of their big three last night. Yeah. We'll tell you if we think Brooklyn has proven their title contender. That's next. Speak for yourself. Just one book, Brucky Books. Don't mm. make that mistake. Bucky. Saturday is a Fox College Hoops blockbuster as 10th ranked Villanova battles UConn. Shout out Morocco, baby. Followed by number five Illinois taking on Minnesota. It all tips off Saturday at 12.30 Eastern on Fox and the Fox Sports app. <clears throat> Welcome back to Speak for Yourself. The Nets won their third straight last night, beating the Kings without Kevin Durant, who was sidelined with a hamstring injury. Kyrie had a season-high 40 points, and James Harden knocks his fifth triple-double since joining Brooklyn. Man, Slick Rick the Buker is back with us, but I'll show him. Going to you. Have the Nets proven they are title contenders? No, sir. Now, the Nets are making a lot of noise. They're making a lot of noise. I respect it. I've been catching them in their last several games now that the Super Bowl is over. Your boy doesn't have to serve two masters, the NFL, the NBA. Yes. Now, while I have realized that the Nets are putting up a ton of points, I've also realized the Nets are allowing a ton of points. When they're <laughs> big three plays, they allow 121 points a game. Where does that rank in the NBA? <laughs> Dead last. Um, I've also realized the Nets allow 11 more points per game to their opponents 
than their opponents usually score night in and night out. Now, y'all might be saying, Acho, this isn't a big deal, but I'm going to tell y'all the why, not necessarily the what. Because although I played football, I grew up loving basketball, and I grew up loving Steve Nash. The Dallas Mavericks had Nasty Nash, Dirty Dirk, and Filthy Finley. They all had the wristbands. I was at the games. I loved them all. So I followed Steve Nash's whole career. Steve Nash had coached for the Nets. If you remember Steve Nash, when he won his two MVPs, he was playing on one of the most prolific <coughs> offense as the game had seen, led by Mike D'Antoni. Now, they were often number one in offensive rating in 05, 04, when Nash won his first MVP. What happened, though? They went to the finals, the, end, the Western Conference finals. Who they run up against? A Spurs team that was number one defensively, number eight offensively. They mm. lost. The next year, Nash, another MVP, two-time MVP, Steve Nash, <laughs> led that prolific offense during the most permeable years of his career. Again, number two offense. But defensively, they sputtered, the Suns did. They lost again in the conference finals to the Mavs, number nine defensively, number two offensively. Why do I bring this up? Because history has a funny way of repeating itself. This Nets team, mm. number 27 right now in defensive efficiency since James Harden got there, and they've had this big three. Obviously, they're top three in offensive output, off offensive efficiency. It goes great in the regular season. It went great for Steve Nash, who's now the head coach as a player, two-time MVP. But sooner or later, you run up against big dogs in the playoffs and the team that has a better defense plus a competent offense. That will always be the team that wins. Very well said, Acho. No, they have not proved that they are title contenders. Oh my. Have they proved that they're one of the better teams in the league? Absolutely. One of the most dynamic? Without question. But to contend means, and I'm going to read directly from the, uh, the dictionary explanation, engage in a competition or campaign in order to win or achieve something are they capable of winning a title not with the 24th best defensive rating in the league sometimes points can be because of the way you play but defensive rating takes everything into account and there has never been a champion that has been rated that poorly defensively now I'm guessing that Marcellus, if he's going to go the other <laughs> direction, guess, is going to suggest. But guess, yeah, but man. look at their comp look at how they've done against the top teams. Oh. They've demonstrated that they can beat the top teams. Yep. Nine and three, best record against teams above Flip. 500. I'm, I'm jumping ahead, but I want to kill this before you get going, Marcellus. Get I got get more notes. Slick. You know I got nuggets. So if we look at the best team against teams above 500 last year, Marcellus, do you have any idea who that was? I'll tell you. It was your Los Angeles Clippers. Now, I know how we feel about bubble stats in last season, so I'll put that to the side, even though I think that's meaningful. You know who had the best record against teams above 500 the year before? Who? That was the Milwaukee Bucks. Oh, man. How many titles do they have? Mm. So that idea that they can beat the best teams in the regular season is not an indicator that they can beat the best teams in the postseason. Right now, defensively, they haven't proved that they have what it takes, and mm. that's why they haven't proved that they're title contenders. Ooh, slick, got slick, him slick, slick, slick. <laughs> try to go out there with that whole eight mile and try to talk. <laughs> he, he try to come at me, B-Rabbit. Get out of here with that. He uh, what's better than a great defense? A better offense. Um, slick, you try to steal some of my thunder, but I got more. Um, the number one scoring offense, the Brooklyn Nets, and the number one ranked field goal percentage team in the NBA, the Brooklyn Nets find themselves in good company. Now, when we say are they title contenders, absolutely, because they're coming out the East. It's not even a conversation there. Why? Because the Nets are on pace to be the fifth team over the last 10 years to lead the NBA in both scoring and field goal percentage. Now, let's just see how it turned out for the other four teams. I give you the Golden State Warriors 2015. One NBA Finals. Uh, I give you the Golden State Warriors 2015-2016. Lost the NBA Finals. I give you the Golden State Warriors 2017. Won the NBA Finals. I give you the Golden State Warriors. 
Warriors 2017-2018 won the NBA Finals. Y'all need to stop playing with me and stop playing with this team. Only Thanos can beat these Avengers. And last time I checked, ooh, LeBron ain't Thanos because he ain't got six Infinity Stones. He only got four. So unless MJ gonna come out of retirement for the fourth or fifth time, it ain't happening. Brooklyn Nets, book them. They coming out the East. Now, before we head to break, make sure to enter the Fox Bet Super 6 NBA contest for a chance to win some cold, hard cash. When you pick the outcomes of six of today's NBA games, you can download the app now and play for free for your chance to win. Coming up, there's a lot of hype around soon-to-be first overall pick Trevor Lawrence after his pro day performance. We'll tell you if we think he can live up to the hype. That's next on Speak. <laughs> Welcome back. Clemson quarterback Trevor Lawrence. Surgery on his non-throwing shoulder went great. Lawrence had an impressive pro day last week conducting a 52-throw workout at Clemson's indoor facility in front of representatives from 17 NFL teams. I guess the rest know they have no shot in drafting. Now Lawrence held his pro day a month early <laughs> so he would be able to recover fully in time for training camp. Lawrence is one of the most hyped and highly anticipated draft prospects of the last mm. decade, drawing comparisons to Andrew Luck and John Elway coming out of college. Now that's a lot of hype. Yeah. Well, Marcellus, are you worried that Trevor Lawrence won't be able to live up to the hype? I'm not worried at all. Um, just looking back at the NFL, all the excessively hyped quarterbacks all worked out. And there have been three to my notice. John Elway, you just mentioned him. Peyton Manning and Andrew Luck. They all worked out, like, for what, different reasons, different outcomes, different pathways, but they all worked out. I remember seeing Peyton Manning day one when he was a rookie. It was my second year, and they were 3-13, and 13, and they were pretty bad. They were 3-13 and 13 to draft him, then they were 3-13 and 13 again. And a lot of outsiders was like, Peyton Manning, what's he doing? He's out here throwing more interceptions than he is touchdowns. Boo, what a waste of a pick. And I remember our defensive coordinators, <laughs> whether it was Wade Phillips, or it was Ted Cottrell sitting there like, we better get him now because it's about to be over. And the next year, what? 13-3. I'm not saying Jacksonville's going to have that type of turnaround, but the expectations are so low. But there's talent on that roster. And more than talent, there's money and cap space. They're going to be able to build around Trevor Lawrence. He's going to have an impact, and it's going to happen fast. I respect it. The, my concern, Marcellus, let me go a little more uh, macro, a little more grandiose okay. than, than your sample size. There were 17 quarterbacks taken, number one overall since Peyton Manning. Only two have winning playoff records. Yeah. And their last name they're both men, <laughs> right? Like, uh, since Eli yeah, Manning, you yeah. haven't seen a quarterback with a winning playoff record who was number one overall taken. Mm. Because if you said this countless times before and it rings true, if you're taking number one overall, you're not going to a quality franchise for the most part. Mm. We talk about Patrick Mahomes. If Patrick Mahomes would have gone to the Chicago Bears, I would assume things would look a little bit different. You think? If Patrick <laughs> Mahomes would have gone, I don't even know who had the number one overall pick that year, but things would look differently. But Mahomes goes to a Chiefs team that, as you alluded to, they had 12 wins a year before. Mm. So there's a reason that he gets rolling right away, whereas Deshaun Watson is still out here sputtering, even though he's been phenomenal individually, mm. his organization is bad. Trevor Lawrence, he's going to have his hands cut out, cut out. He's going to have his work cut out for him and his mm. hands tied up. Mm. Because as you look at over the course of history, number one overall picks, the last 12 quarterbacks selected number one overall, 12 career playoff wins, yeah. no Super Bowl wins. Trevor Lawrence is just going to have to outdo history, uh. if you will, or change his last name to Manning. Uh, who had the number one pick that year? Browns. Browns. doo um, Let me tell you about this, man. Your comps don't work in this conversation because all your comps were lesser players who weren't as heralded as those excessively hyped quarterbacks. Peyton Manning, Andrew Luck, John Elway is this level, this tier, not everybody else. But let's, let's rap, let's rap, let's, let's rap, rap, let's rap. Let's rap. Um, do you think if, if Patrick Mahomes goes to the Browns, who, were still, who weren't coached by Stefanski at the time, if he goes to that Browns organization, do you think he has the same success? Because oh, it's I know easy for you and I to say they're not the same quarterback, but we have we have the ability to now look in hindsight. Yeah. We have hindsight bias, if you will. Yeah. If Trevor Lawrence, and so now that we know if Patrick Mahomes would have gone to the number one overall team, he wouldn't have been successful, at least not as successful. Yeah. 
can you really assume <laughs> that Trevor Lawrence going to Jacksonville, new head coach, things are in shambles, Bruh. and he don't make noise? As a prospect, Patrick Mahomes is not even close to Trevor Lawrence in terms of hype and really in terms of what he did at the collegiate level. Being real, like you can... You can project what Patrick Mahomes would be. That's why they moved up in the draft to get him. But they didn't move up in the draft. The Cleveland Browns didn't move up to number one and, and get him or pick him at number one because he wasn't the same dude. Like, Trevor Lawrence is a different animal, at least in perception so far at the collegiate level. He's on that level way. Peyton... Andrew Luck can't use Beverly Hills as comps, Mr. Beverly Hills adjacent. <laughs> I've been over your houses, 800 square feet. Can't use them 8,000 square foot homes as the comps. They're not the same. Coming up, <laughs> LeBron James thinks he could have made it in the NFL. <laughs> we'll tell you if we agree. Next, speak for yourself. No, damn well I ain't been in your house. <laughs> this pandemic chaos. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself. Let's head to the association where LeBron James said he almost made the jump to the NFL during the 2011 NBA lockout. LeBron told The Athletic he was offered workouts from both the Cowboys and Seahawks, and he was confident that he would have, quote, tried out and made the team. So, Acho, you love or hate LeBron saying he would have made an NFL team? I like it. I like it a lot. I don't know if I love it. You know it? Like, you know when you go to, uh, this is one of my favorite ice cream places, Cold Stone, it's love it oh. like it, gotta have it. Mm, I so think good. I might get like it. Like, I don't, mm. I don't gotta have it, but I like it. Um, I look at it like this. I look at three players. Let's talk about Jimmy Graham, Antonio Gates, uh, uh, Tony Gonzalez. Let's go. All had basketball backgrounds. Yes, all go. of them. And they all dominated in the league. Yes. Now, Tony Gonzalez hooped. Uh, uh, Cal, if I'm not mistaken, Antonio mm -hmm. Gates, yep. was Kent State, yep. my history. My dog. Right. Jimmy Graham was at the U. They all had fairly, fairly different levels of basketball success, mm. but all had tremendous NFL success. Mm. Now, if you're telling me there is a correlation between kind of those tight end greats and a basketball prowess, LeBron James, 6'8", 275, clearly a 4'4", at minimum a 4'5", depending on how long it takes him to get going. I like it, Sal. I think he could have he could have made some noise. I know this. As a linebacker, if it's a cover two drop and I got to guard number three, number three being the tight end down the middle of the seam, I am not trying to look over my shoulder and see 6'8 LeBron James going up to Moss. Mm, no, sir. Mm, I don't want that ain't happening. Okay. I don't know why you don't love this. Like, if I were an evaluator, you think Trevor Lawrence getting hyped? If LeBron James was coming out in the draft right now, give me him. It's this simple. I always tell people, at the apex of athleticism, at the apex, the top of the pyramid, the athletic pyramid, is a basketball player dribbling. And then you come down and you find football players. Let me give you an example. You said it. I add Julius Peppers as well. Now, all of those guys were sus mm -hmm. at basketball. Now, they could kill me and they could kill everybody directly. We get it. But I'm talking about compared to NBA players. Yeah, Sus. Yeah. And then they dominate in football. But you didn't do the flip. Let's do the flip. Somebody who dominated football and decided he wanted to play basketball. Charlie Ward. Now, I remember Charlie Ward running around circles, throwing the ball dark and killing people in the collegiate level in football. And then he said, I'm going to go to the NBA. Did he make play. some noise? I thought he made a little bit of noise. He was a good basketball like Charlie, player. Uh, Mark was, Jackson, Charlie he, Ward. Boy, he wasn't close to who he was in football, in the basketball. Matter of fact, there were, he won the Heisman in football, and then he was on the team doing okay and good in basketball. You, dog, it's not even a conversation for real. You, I have a list. This list is that long of all the dudes who were in, in basketball, but then came to football and laughed at our sport. It's just easier to play if you're that type of athlete. Let me say why I don't respect it, and it's because you and I I've had this dialogue before. Yeah. I hate disrespecting sports by simply saying, oh, if you're good at this, you can be good at that. Remember Nate Robinson stepped into that boxing ring ready to throw hands, and mm. he got thrown hands. <laughs> um, so I, yeah. I hate disrespecting sports by just blatantly assuming, okay, well, you dominated in this venue. You can go out and dominate in that venue because it takes a whole lot of practice. LeBron James can't put his hand in the dirt and have a club rip like Marcellus Wiley. I don't care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Spin move but like you know what would have been better than my club rip? LeBron's. Because, <laughs> dog, let me tell you, T.O. still playing in, like, pro-ams and celebrity matches all the time basketball. 
T.O. in football. What? Like, I got a list. Dog, this is, Donovan McNabb even got a little kind of hand handle. Football, laughing at it. Like, it's a whole different athleticism, man. Oh, I wish I could play basketball. I would have been much better at football. But I'm stuck here too. talking to you. And more money. <laughs> Charlie Ward style. Coming up, Uncle Jimmy is in the house, and he has some words of his own for the NBA. Wake up, Unc. That's next. <laughs> I'll speak Coach for yourself. Uh-oh. What did we say? <laughs> Before we go, Uncle Jimmy joins us. Uncle, I hear you have some thoughts for the NBA. Let's hear it. Some thoughts. Hey, man, did y'all see Draymond Green's press conference? Yeah, we heard yeah, it. Yeah, we did. Y'all see him with that dumbass look on his face? Looking like, my name, Little Dar. <laughs> nah. I'm out. I had to watch Andre Drummond before the game be on the sidelines, ready to work, and then have somebody walk up to him and tell him that he could have the night off with pay. <laughs> Man, that's simply some bull-ish. James Harden specifically asked to be traded to another team, and what happened? Why you do James Hey, no one fights the fact that James Harden hot-dogged it. Yes, he ate 37 hot dogs <laughs> during a halftime blowout to the Golden State Warriors. So therefore, it shouldn't be surprising to nobody that he showed up out of shape. But what was surprising was the fact that they chose to circumcise him in public. <laughs> James Harden was forced off. to endure some things that no man should ever have to endure. He was forced to receive lap dances in unclean conditions. He was forced to eat greasy lemon pepper weed. And everybody knows that can give a black man hypertension. You can. If the, you can. the NBA thinks you that just the because they play their players hundreds of millions of dollars, they got the right to tell us what to do. They can't expect us to stay in shape and watch what we say. That's some bull ish. <laughs> he nailed it. If they care about us. They need to be letting us look like this. That's it for us. See you tomorrow, Draymond. He ain't in the studio. <laughs>